Chapter 4 of The Black Eagle Mystery. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mike Overby, Midland, Washington. Dedicated to Uni. The Black Eagle Mystery by Geraldine Bonner. Chapter 4. Molly Tells the Story. The day after the Harland inquest, I meant to go down and see Iola and find out if she'd heard anything from Miss Whitehall. But that day I got sidetracked some way or other, and the next it rained. Usually I don't mind rain, but this was the real wet, straight kind that would get in at you if you wore a diver's suit. As I stood at the parlor window, looking down at the street, all pools and puddles, with the walls shining under a thin glaze of water and the umbrellas like wet, wet, black mushrooms, I got faint-hearted. I could just as well phone, and, if anything had transpired, it was the business I was uneasy about, go down and help Iola through the fit of blind staggers she'd be bound to have. So presently it was. Hello, Iola. I was coming down today, but it's too moistuous. Then, Iola's voice, sort of groaning. Oh, Molly, is that you? I do wish it had been fine and you'd have come. Why? Anything wrong? Oh, yes, everything. Miss Whitehall isn't back yet, and Mr. Ford's hardly been in at all, and it's such a gloom on him you wouldn't know him. And I'm awful discouraged. Have you tried to see Miss Whitehall? No, I can't seem to get up enough spunk. Why don't you phone her? Well, I don't know. I'm sort of scared of what I'll hear. I thought he'd better sit around and wait, and then I thought I ought to find out, and between the two... Oh, dear, what's the use? That was just like Iola. The only way you can be sure she's got a mind at all is the trouble she has making it up. If it's true that men like the helpless kind, she ought to have a string of lovers as long as the line at the box office when Caruso sings Pagliacci. I wonder I ever got married. Tell you what, girlie, I said. You come up tonight and dine with me. Himself is going to be late, and we two bandits will steal out after dinner and make a raid on Miss Whitehall's. Even then she hung back. I had to coax and urge, and it was only me promising I'd see her through and if necessary asked the questions, made her finally agree. The rain held on all day, and it was teeming when we started out. Miss Whitehall's flat was on the other side of town, the East Sixties, and we had to go round the park, crowding on and off cars, fighting our way through packs of people, Iola clawing at my back and catching her umbrella in men's hats and women's hair, till you'd think she did it on purpose. When we got out to the street we turned east, walking from Madison Avenue over Park with its great huge apartment houses and then on a ways, not far, but far enough for you to feel Miss Whitehall's home wasn't as stylishly located as her office. Iola was that nervous I was afraid she'd forget the number, but we found it, on a corner over a drugstore, where there were large glassy bottles in the window and advertisements of ladies offering pills and candy with such glad, inviting smiles you'd know it was damaged stock. The entrance was round on the side, and we stood in the vestibule, dimly lit, with a line of letter boxes on each side. I couldn't help but whisper, You'd never think from her offices she lives over a store. And Iola answered, pushing the button under a letterbox marked Mrs. Serena Whitehall. It's a shock to me. I'd no more connect her with a push button than I would you with a glass-topped entrance and a man in knee pants. The door clicked and we went up the stairs, one feeble little electric bulb furnishing the light. There was a smell in the air like one of the tenants had had lamb stew for dinner and another was smoking the kind of cigar that tells you it's strong and hearty, half a block off. The first floor landing was hers, a card in the frame by the door told us so, and we pressed the bell, hearing it give a loud whirring ring inside. The door was opened by a young girl, very neat in a black dress and white apron. She was sure we couldn't speak to Miss Whitehall, but perhaps Mrs. Whitehall would see us, and she showed us up the tiny little hall into the dining room. I'd never have believed a room furnished so plain could be so elegant. There was a square of brown carpet on the floor and ecru linen curtains, no lace, just hem-stitched, at the windows, and on the side table some silver. Yet it had a refined, classy look. Two doors opened from it, one into the hall hung with a blue portery and double ones that a guest led into the parlor. We could hear voices coming from there, low and murmuring. By this time Iola was that nervous she was licking her lips with her tongue, like a baby that's had a sugar stick. I was just edging round to give her a dig and whisper, Brace up, when the curtain into the hall was lifted and a lady came in. She was well along in her years, near to fifty, I'd say. I knew she was Mrs. Whitehall. She was very dignified and gentle, 
with black hair turning gray and lots of lines on her forehead and round her eyes, which were dark like her hair and had a sad, weary expression. I guessed she'd been handsome once, but she looked as if she'd had her troubles, and when I heard her voice, low and so quiet, there was something in it that made me feel she was having them still. I had promised to be spokesman, and, not seeing any reason to waste time, I went straight to the point. Mrs. Whitehall stood listening, her hands clasped on the back of a chair, her eyes on the little fern plant in the center of the table. "'Perhaps it would be best,' she said in that soft, faded sort of voice, "'if Miss Barry were to see my daughter. I hardly know what to say to her.' She turned and left the room by the hall door, and Iola gasped at me. "'Oh, Molly, it's true!' "'Don't cross your bridges till you come to them,' I said. But all the same, I thought it looked bad. "'What'll I do if the business shuts down?' "'Shut up till you know if it does,' I whispered back. The double doors rolled back, and Mrs. Whitehall stood between them. She looked at Iola. "'If you'll come in here, Miss Barry,' she said, "'my daughter will see you.' It was plain she didn't expect me, so I stood by the table without moving. As Mrs. Whitehall drew back and before Iola got to the doorway, there was a moment when I saw into the room. It looked real artistic. Flowered cretonne curtains, wicker chairs with cushions and low bookcases around the walls, the whole lit up by the yellow glow of lamps. But I wasn't interested in the furniture. What caught my eye was a couch just opposite the open door, on which a woman was lying. There was a lamp on the stand beside her, and its light fell full over her. If I hadn't known Carol Whitehall was there, I'd have guessed right off it was she from the likeness to her mother. She had just the same hair and deep, rich-looking eyes, except in her the hair was black as night and the eyes were young. She had a newspaper in her hand, and as the doors opened she looked up, intent and questioning, and I saw she was beautiful. She was like a picture, leaning forward with that inquiring expression, her features clear in the flood of soft light. I got an impression of her then that I've never forgotten, of force and strength. It didn't come from anything especial in her face, but from something in her general makeup something vivid and warm, like she was alive straight through. They stayed in the room some time while I was waiting. I'd sized up everything in sight, especially two little glass lamps on the sideboard that I thought would be a nice present for Babbitts to give me on my next birthday, when the door slid back and Iola came in. She didn't say anything, and seemed in a hurry to be off. Mrs. Whitehall showed us out, very polite but depressed, and when the door was shut on us and we stole down the stairs, I felt the worst had come. In the vestibule, I looked at Iola and said, Well? She was struggling with her umbrella, her face bent over it. Fired, she answered in a husky voice. The rain was coming down in torrents, and, wanting to cuddle up comforting against her, I didn't raise my umbrella, and we walked up the street, squeezed together, with the downpour spattering around us. Believe me, the water fell under Iola's umbrella pretty nearly as heavy as it did outside it. Miss Whitehall was broke. Mr. Harland had been her financial backer, and now she was ruined and the business would close. The surprise and horror of the whole thing had prostrated her, and as soon as she was better she'd wind up the Azalea Woods estates and try and sublet her offices, on which she still had a six-month's lease. She was awful sweet, Iola sobbed. She gave me a full month's salary and she said she'd meant to keep me forever. Oh, Molly, why did it have to happen? I squeezed her and said, that's all right, dearie. We'll all hustle and get you another job. I got lots of money, and what's mine's yours, the way it always is between good and true friends. But Iola wouldn't be comforted. I can't take your money. I never took a cent yet, and I thought I was fixed for life. I thought even if the business didn't pan out big, she'd marry Mr. Barker and get a place for me. Marry Mr. Barker? I cried out, astonished. Yes, that's what I thought was coming believe me, I was surprised. She'd never dropped a hint of it. Why didn't you tell me that before? I asked. Because Tony Ford told me not to. He said I wasn't to tell anybody. That Bark would be in such a big bug it would get in the papers and that might break it all up. But are you sure? Did he act like he was in love with her? We were passing one of those arc lights on the Park Avenue, and the scornful look she cast at me, tears and all, was plain. Wouldn't you think a man was in love, even if he was a magnate, who'd buy a house and a lot just for an excuse to see a lady? Did you ever hear him making love to her? No, but I didn't need to. I've been made love to enough myself to know the signs without hearing. 
first it was our business and i believed it was only that then one day when mr ford was out he came in and lingered round making conversation you know the way they do it and for all he was a magnet mr barker was just the same as the errand boy that's the way it is with men they got no variety he wanted to know about our home and the farm and before that oh indiana a fine state indiana it made me laugh to see him with his hook nose and gray hair hanging up the same line of talk that billy dunn gave me when i was in the linen envelope place did she seem to care for him not at first she was very formal just a bow and then right off about the bungalow but he had the symptoms from the start looking at her like he couldn't take his eyes off and not caring whether the bungalow was as small as a hen coop or as big as a waldorf they went along that way for a while then something happened a fight i guess when tony ford and i weren't there anyhow after it she was so cold and distant you'd wonder he had the nerve to come then one afternoon he came in and asked her low i heard him if he could have a few words with her in the private office she hesitated but i guess she couldn't see her way to refusing so in they went and had a long powwow whatever it was they said to each other it smoothed out all the wrinkles after that she was as different to him as summer is to winter in my own mind i thought they were engaged for she'd brighten up when he came in and smile i never saw her smile like that at any one and once when they thought i couldn't hear i heard him call her dear they'd go into the private office and talk gee how they talked and always low like they were afraid tony ford and i might overhear and on top of all that he disappears perhaps that's why she's been sick sure it is it's bad enough to lose your own money but wouldn't it make you sick to lose millions let alone the man you're in love with even if he has a nose you could hang an umbrella on poor thing i said for i could see now what the lady lying on the couch had been up against we're all poor things said iola beginning to get sorry for herself again miss whitehall and the man that's dead and tony ford who's lost his job and me poor unfortunate me that i thought was on velvet for the rest of my days babbitts didn't get home till late that night but i was so full of what iola had said that i waited up for him when he did come he hadn't but one kiss when i pulled away from him and told him doesn't it seem to you soapy i said that that story ought to go back to mr whitney he looked at me sideways with a sly questioning glance why he asked why if barker's in love with her don't you think maybe he'll try and creep back or get in touch with her some way he burst out laughing oh morning dew there's a lot of nice things about you but one of the nicest is that you never disappoint a fellow i was wondering if you'd see it go back to mr whitney it'll go back the first thing tomorrow morning and you'll take it end of chapter four